Okay, everybody. Looks like a bunch of Baptists today. Everybody's straying in here, huh? So, uh, we got a guest today. Hey, you want to say hi? Say hi. Say hi. <laughs> this is my grandson. This is Ronan. And he goes by Roro. Roro. Yeah. So, all right, let's go ahead and pray this morning. You want to pray? Okay. Lord, just uh, thank you for everybody that could make it today, Lord. I just pray that you'll watch over Tim and Pam as they travel back home and any others that are not able to make it today. I just pray that you'll be with them. Be with Andy today as he speaks, Lord, and fill him with your Holy Spirit and give him the words to say. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Say amen. Say amen. 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 Okay. Well, good morning. I like those songs that use words out of the scripture like that. So that was a neat one. Well, today I want to switch gears. Uh, the past few weeks um, we've talked about, well, the past few months, really, if you take all of it in, talked about the life of Ruth, and we then we looked at the life of Samson, and we finished that up last week. And over the next couple of weeks, well, I'll be here this week and next week, and then I have my surgery. So then you'll be... Uh, then who's the week after that? Is it is it Tim? So you'll be persecuted. I mean, you'll you'll be privileged to listen to Tim. Uh, <laughs> just teasing. He's not here, so we can say whatever we want, right? <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, most of you know something has happened in our country in the last few weeks. Um, it's something that a lot of people get excited about. It's something that is almost a pseudo-religion in our country. And I'm talking about, anybody know? Yeah. Football season. <laughs> I'm not talking about, some of y'all thought I was going to talk about the elections, didn't you? you thought I was going to get political. No, we're going sports. <laughs> um, in fact, there is a pretty big game here in Kansas City today where um, the Cincinnati Bengals have come into town to plot, play the Chiefs and should be. What's that? They came to us. I did wear a black shirt and an orange watch band today. No. <laughs> um, should be a good game. I enjoy football. I like to watch football. I love football season. I like to watch the Chiefs, and I even like to watch the Bengals. And both teams, though, today are going to come out with a game plan. They've got their strategy to win, right? Both coaches have been watching a lot of game film. They've been putting plans together, and they feel like these plans that they have made is going to give them the best chance to walk away with a win today. But it'll be a battle. And the, on, uh, the only way for one of them to walk away with the win is to put into practice the plan that they have made, right? They watch the game film. They know their opponent's strengths and weaknesses. They know their strengths and weaknesses. And so because of that, they've got this plan that they're going to put into place. And the same thing is true in our Christian lives, in our spiritual lives. Which team are we on? Who's developing our, the game plan for our life? Are we trying to, I mean, in some senses, we can even come to the coach and tell the coach what our plan is, right? And try to tell him which plays he should run. Or do we listen to our coach? Now, you might be thinking, well, how in the world are you going to find any verses in the Bible that talk about football? It's all said. I got it taken care of for you. I don't know. There we go. Luke 6, 46 says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Sounds like you're talking to your kids, doesn't it? Why do you call me dad if you don't listen to me? Why do you call me mom if you don't listen to me? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruin. Every team has a coach. And there's one man who calls the plays, 
one man who knows all of the strengths and all of the weaknesses of his players, and he knows the opponent's strengths and weaknesses. And the coach is the one who calls the plays. So these plays designed around his player strengths and designed to really exploit the opponent's weaknesses. And the, 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 the players are supposed to run the plays that are called by the coach, right? Supposed to. Now, if there's no coach, what happens? Chaos. Chaos. The, the offensive line doesn't know which way to block. The running back doesn't know if he's getting the ball, if he's supposed to block, if he's to run on the flat and try to catch a pass. The receivers are just running like little kids running out in the field trying to hope to get open and hope that the quarterback knows where they're going, right? There's, it, it is. It's, it's true chaos. Everybody wants to run the play that makes them look like the star. They want to look good. They're not too worried about the team. It would be true and total chaos. I mean, it would just be everybody doing what they want to do, mass chaos. And the same is true in our lives. We need somebody who has the big picture, who sees everything, who knows our strengths and weaknesses, who knows the enemy's playbook, who is going to tell us what play we're supposed to run. See, there's a lot of parallels in this story that we just read to the game of football, and I want to look at a couple of them this morning. Here's the first one. There's a coach, and you're not him. Isn't that deep? That's real deep, isn't it? I, I, I think that's, you know, there can only be one head coach, right? Only one. It ain't me, and it ain't you. There's only one God, and it ain't me, and it ain't you either. You know, I love the fact that in the Bible, when, when the Bible begins to talk about God, did you know the Bible never tries to explain or anything the existence of God? The Bible just says, in the beginning, God. It's just there. The Bible doesn't try to tell us where he came from, who he is, anything about him to start with. It just says, in the beginning, God. There's no attempt to explain him. Just lays it out there for us. The truth of the matter is, everybody believes in God. There may be some people who say they don't believe in God, but inside of us, there's something that, there's a witness inside of every person that knows truth. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, draws every person at some point in their life. So I believe everybody, I, I don't really truly believe that there is any atheists out there. There's people who don't want to be uh, accountable to a God, so they say they're an atheist. Because if I say that there's a God, then that means I have to answer to him, right? Right? If I say that there's a God, that means there's a power bigger than me. If I say there's a God, then somebody set some rules up that I'm supposed to follow. So if I just deny his existence, I can say, well, there is no God, so I can, I'm the ultimate authority in my life. So there's a hole inside of every one of us. We try to fill it with all kinds of things before we come to Christ. Did you ever notice, did you ever stop and think about all the things you tried to fill that hole with in your life? Some of us tried to fill it with a lot of junk. Maybe if I could just drink enough, or if I could take enough pills, or if I could sleep with enough people, or if I could have the right people in my life, or maybe if I have the right friends in my life, or maybe if I just get enough money, I can pack it into that hole and it'll fill it up. There's a problem with that, though. You can never get enough. It doesn't work. That's why they keep having to go back to it. There's only one thing that can fill that hole. That's the coach. That's God. And once he's in it, it's full. And you don't have to keep going back because he's filled it. So when I think about this, there's a coach, and it's not me. That means there's someone bigger than me who I need to listen to in my life. So here's, here's the second thing in this, this story, talking about these, these houses, and we're going to bring it all together in just a minute. He has a playbook, and i got to choose to follow it. Just like a coach. There's a coach, and he's got a playbook. And we've got to follow the playbook that the coach has, right? Even Patrick Mahomes out there, if you look at him, he's got something on his forearm. What is it? That's the plays, right? 
Now, he's given a lot of freedom to, to change some plays and to do some things, but he's extremely talented, and, and the coach trusts him. He's earned that trust. But for most of us, if, it, if, if I was to walk out there on that field today, number one, I wouldn't last very long. But the coach wouldn't be trusting me to make plays and to say which ones I thought. If you look at a new quarterback coming into the NFL, he's got to follow those plays. And a lot of them, it flips up, and they got more plays. So the coach calls it in, and they've got that little microphone or that little speaker in their helmet, and they hear the play, and they're looking at everything and telling everybody where they're supposed to go and the whole nine yards, and they're following the playbook. If you look at Andy Reid standing on the sidelines, it looks like he's got a Waffle House menu up to his face, doesn't it? That laminated thing. I saw a meme the other day of somebody who, who put the Waffle House menu on his thing, and when he held it up, they were calling out he was calling out his order for after the football game you know i'll have hash browns covered smothered <laughs> whatever they say they are <laughs> but he has a playbook and god god has a playbook for our lives he loves us and he has a plan for us we all know the verses of john three sixteen that says god loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. He loves us so much that he did what? He gave. He gave his only, he gave his best, he gave his son. You know, there are some people who, like we said, they say that there is no God so that they don't have to answer to him. There's others who believe that there is a God out there, but he's not involved in my life. He's out there somewhere, but he never thinks about me. He's got bigger things to deal with. He's got countries that he has to, to, to deal with. He's got all this big stuff in the world, but he doesn't think about me. I love the verse of Jeremiah that says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. The, the word plan there, I know the plans I have for you. That word plan has the idea of a well-thought-out plan. God has a well-thought-out plan for every single one of us. That means God thinks about us. Did you ever think about that? The, the, that God thinks about me? That God thinks about you? With all the people that are around, with all the problems in this world, and God knows there's a lot of them, right? There's a lot of people who, uh, you know, I grew up here and my dad say all the time, there's a lot of good power in heaven going to waste right now. <laughs> God could zap some people and deal with some things. But there's all, there's all kinds of things going on. But the God, he, he thinks about me. And he even knows the number of hairs on our head. Some of us, that's a big number, and some of us, that's not very many. The very hairs on your head are all numbered. Think about that. He knows details about us. The God who created the heavens and the earth, the stars, the human being, every human being that's ever lived, everything who spoke and everything happened knows and is interested in us. He cares. As much as he loves you and as powerful as he is, though he never forces himself on any one of us. Gives us this free will to choose, his, to choose him and his will or not to. He gives us the choice to follow his playbook. He could have forced it on us, right? He's all powerful. When he created us, he could have created us like robots, that every single one of us believe in him, that we're all Christians, that we're all doing right, we're all doing all. He could have created us like that, right? But he didn't. He gave us a choice. He gave us the ability or response ability to choose. And just like a good coach who knows the, en the enemies, the opponent, and sometimes it feels like an enemy on a football field. The opponent's playbook, our God is the same. He loves us, and he's for us, and he knows the adversary who is against us, and he knows his playbook. That's why he tells us in verses like 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He tells us in Ephesians, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, 
but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers of this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore put on every piece of God's armor, so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle you'll be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith and st to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And this is where most of the time we stop reading the armor of God and we stop talking about the, this, this spiritual battle. But the very next verse says, pray in the Spirit at all times. And on every occasion, stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Most of the time we leave out verse 18, but this verse goes along with this section. And praying in the Spirit is a huge part of spiritual warfare. We have an enemy that's after us, and we have a coach who helps direct us, but we have to choose him. So what happens then? I know that there's a coach, and I know it's not me. He's got a playbook, and I've got to choose to follow it. So what if I follow it, and what if I don't? What happens to me? Well, what if I follow the playbook? What if I follow what he says? Here's where we're going to tie it back. Verse 47 that we started with says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teachings, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. If you follow the coach's playbook and you execute, what happens? You win. If you do what you're supposed to do, if we follow our coach, if we follow God's playbook, which is his word, then we are going to win. The rewards for following him are huge because the storms of life are coming. Have you ever been in a storm in your life? Have you ever been through something that you just thought, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this? I think I'd just rather be done. The storms of life are coming. If you're not in one, here's some encouragement for you. One is coming soon. And if you've already just come out of one, here's good news. There's another one coming too. Right? They don't stop, do they? And it seems the longer we live life, the storms, they don't get smaller. They seem to get bigger, don't they? So the storms of life are coming and there's nothing we can do to stop them. But if I'm following God's playbook, I can weather the storm. I'll be like that house that's built on the solid foundation. I've got that solid rock. And the floods can come and the, the streams, the floodwaters can come up and they can beat on my life. But nothing's going to shake it. The storms of life can come and violently beat on me. But I can make it through. Why? Because I have founded my life on God. He is my source of everything. Through all of it, my house can stand because of having the right foundation, the rock. And our rock is our coach. It's our God. Psalm 28 one says, I pray to you, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for you are silent. I might as well give up and die. O Lord, my rock. Psalm 18.2, the Lord is my rock my fortress, my savior, my God is my rock in whom I find protection. He's my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. When we base our life on our coach, our God, we're founded on the rock and there's nothing more secure for us than to live a life that are centered around God. Because it's then and only then that we can survive the storms of life. So if I Follow the playbook. I, I know I've got a coach. I know it ain't me. And I know he's got a playbook. And i got to choose to follow it. And if I choose to follow it, then I'm going to survive the, the storms of life. Because they're coming. I was thinking about that the other day. The storms of life. Now, I don't know how people survive. I, I, I was thinking about funerals because I was asked to do one and wasn't able to just from somebody in the community. But, man, it reminded me once again, how do people who don't have a relationship with God how do they go through loss like that? What do they have to hope for? I mean, what, what do you say to somebody like that? Oh, you're going to get to see him again. No, you're not, you can't lie. 
right? That's one of the big ten. Thou shalt not lie. So can't lie to him. So what do you say? It's tough. How do we walk through the storms of life with people that we work with and our neighbors and the people in our community? How do we walk through the storms of life with our kids who are grown and have kids of their own? How do we walk through the storms of life with our families and our churches and, and our communities? How do we walk through these storms of life? The only way we can, the only way we can survive it is, is just like what Paul said. We grieve, we don't grieve like others do because we have a hope. Because we have a coach. Because we've got a God who loves us and cares about us. So if I follow his playbook, not only will I win, but I'll survive the storms of life. But what happens if I don't? Because again, he's a gentleman. He's not going to push himself on me. So what happens, what are the consequences if I don't follow him? What's the big deal? Well, I'll just, I'll be okay. Right? I, I, I can survive. I got my just a little bit of Jesus. I know I'm going to heaven. I got my fire insurance, so I'm good. I go to church when I'm okay, when it's convenient, when, when things, when I don't have anything else, when the Chiefs aren't playing. Good thing it's a 325 game today, right? And not a 12 o'clock game. <laughs> But what do I do then? I mean, what's, what's, what's the consequences? Well, those verses for, that we looked at at the beginning, Luke 6, verse 49 says, But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. You ever watch it or, or see a house that the foundation had a problem? I was watching, there was some flooding, and um, I forget where it was, it was on the news. And I saw a video clip of it. And the, uh, I want to say North Carolina, but I know that's not right. Um, but the water just kept eroding the bank and eroding the bank. And you could watch this house begin to start to go. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's in the water and it's floating down the river. Our life is a lot like that house. We can build our house next to the water and it's beautiful and, and we can try to build our house the way we think it should be built. We can center our life around the things that look good and feel good and that we like. But when the storms of life come, what's going to hold us up? But if we found a, if the foundation of our life, our family of everything is God, when those problems come, if that house had been sitting on a rock, would that water have been able to erode that soil enough to pull that house down? Maybe after a couple hundred years, <laughs> you know, but certainly not just a quick flash storm that those people were facing. The storms of life come, and if the foundation isn't right, I'm not going to survive. I have two choices. I can center my life around God, or I can center it around something else. Those are my two choices, God or something else. And when the floods come and the stream beats on us and it comes and hits us hard. The consequences of that are going to be shown by the choice that I made. The choice that I made is going to come out real quick. You see, you can put those two houses, when everything's pretty, you can put those two houses next to each other. And guess what? They both look nice and pretty, don't they? But the difference is when the problems come. That exposes what's underneath. I want my life to be founded and based on the rock, not on the just stuff. But for me to do that, I've got to execute God's plan and I've got to listen to my coach. So, football. We all like it? It's fun? I told you I was going to tie it into the Bible somehow. You didn't believe me, did you? Set my turn on. There we go. So let's talk about it. What stood out to you or what stands out to you in this story of building our life, our house on the rock or on sand? What stands out to you? Dave? I've had conversations with Tim and probably Bill and maybe you before about, well, who are these people that are saying, Lord, Lord? Well, you know that they're religious people because they're using the right words. You know, they're saying, Lord, Lord. And they're coming to Jesus like, like they know Him. Yeah. Uh, so they're people that they at least think that they're uh, 
they're Christians or they think they're doing the right thing and they're, they're religious, uh, but it turns out that they're not because they've never followed the playbook. Yeah. And when I look at the state of Christianity, you know, the kingdom of Christianity today, uh, it's, it's, it's evidently the same as it was then. Because you have individual people that call themselves Christians, you have individual churches, and you have denominations, and they have felt the freedom to either reject the playbook of Scripture, or to ignore it, or to mm -hmm. feel like they can change it whenever they want to to yeah. meet their own, you know, desires and expectations. Right. And you know, so they're doing all kinds of religious stuff, and they're doing all kinds of good stuff. And they're getting involved in social justice issues and all those sorts of things. Uh, and they're kind of getting away with it now. But the day's going to come when when those kind of people are going to be saying, Lord, Lord, he's going to say, who are you? You never followed the playbook ever. Mm. Uh, and it's going to be a, a, a real day of reckoning for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, so it just, it just amazes me the arrogance that we think that we have the authority to ignore God's playbook or change it whenever we want to. We don't have that authority. That's ridiculous to think yeah. of that. But that's the attitude that we see so prevalent even in you know in churches these days. Well, we don't like that part. Uh, uh, we'll do it another way. But man, I mean, the time's coming when that won't work anymore. Uh, so. Absolutely. Yeah, that first verse, like you said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? You know, they think they're on the team. They, they went into the, the clubhouse and bought a jersey. One wasn't issued to them, but they went in and bought one at the store, and they got their foam finger. But they're never going to get on the field because they're not on the team. Hmm. That's good, Dave. That's real good. Anybody else? Something jump out at you? Dave's comment sparked the, something in my head. You know, it, it's um, talking about people changing scripture and kind of altering the definition of, uh, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and um, just putting our own spin on, on God. And I was thinking about when Peter said to Jesus, no, Lord, you know, and, hmm. and Jesus commented back and said to him, get behind me, Satan. And it's almost like we have said that to God in, in the church at times, right? Like we've said, no, God, that's not right anymore. We're going to do it differently. And one day Jesus will in fact say to those who have said, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that? And we'll say, I never knew you. And what a, what a tragedy that is. Like, you know. Mm -hmm. Paul says that if Christ has never been raised from the dead, then we, we should be pitied above all else. And in the same way, like, if, if people have put their hope into a pseudo-Jesus and have fooled themselves to believe that that's God, they should be pitied more than anyone else. I mean, how tragic, how sad is that to have heard the name of Jesus and to have listened or had access to the scripture and to never have really trusted and put our hope in God. It, it, it's just sad. Yeah. It's just absolutely sad. I don't know how you say those two, the first two words you said together. No, no Lord. Because Lord. <laughs> Lord means he's in control and I'm telling the one who's in control no. You can't say no and Lord and but mean both. If you're saying no, you don't mean Lord. And if you're saying Lord, you don't mean no. They don't work. Rachel? Um, I was saying like what Marcus was saying, I'm something I've been running into a lot recently is with a lot of leaders in churches. Um, is that because they have adopted or adapted to some sort of um, comfortable version of who God is? or who Jesus is because there's this desire to get butts and seats and um, to be accommodating that these leaders are setting an unrealistic 
vision and expectation of who he is, but they're also standing in the way of every single person that's in their congregation from truly knowing and believing. So they they become a block between them and Jesus because if they're really standing up there and speaking and living their life in a way that they believe or that they're allowing people to believe is who Christ is, they're creating space for other people to justify their behaviors. For they're creating space, and I'm, I'm running into it right now with a leader in their home, they're allowing non-biblical things to happen there. They're inviting people over and they're creating space for these things to happen. And I'm seeing the direct repercussions of how these people are saying they're righteous, that they're walking with the Lord, and I see them at the, you know, the altar every time they get, repenting of the same thing on a weekly basis. You know, they, they become a cycle for these people. They keep them in the same place. There's no growth. There's no... Um, yeah, it's called the, the, the principle of the leadership lid. People can't go past the level of the leadership. In order for them to pass, they have to leave. They can't be under that leader. Exactly, and that, that, that is becoming very common. It, it's something that I'm seeing a lot in a lot of different places that I go, is that if you really are trying to increase and grow, you're, you're going to start to pass these people very quickly and significantly, and there seems to be just a lot of lateral transition. And it's, it's really unfortunate, but it's, it's, it's a really big yeah. A really big thing right now that I've personally experienced, but holding those people accountable to that is even harder. Trying to be the one to expose those things and speak on it and bring those things up is not, it's not easy either, but I mean, what do we do with that? Yeah, until they're ready, it's the same principle of someone who needs who you know is living the kind of life where they're addic- in it of, a, of addiction. You can't help somebody who doesn't want help. You can't force it on them. I wish I could help people who didn't want help. You know, when we look at our kids who run away from the Lord, you know, I wish I could smack them back into line, but that doesn't work. I've tried. It doesn't work. It does not work at all. People have to want, and it's, and it's got to be the Holy Spirit inside of them who is who's drawing them. Yes, sir. That means you're such a body. Yes. You tell them about salvation, and they may come to church, uh, fall, and then they quit, and don't read the word. And do they go to hell if well, they never do anything about it? It depends on what they did with Jesus. That's that's the determination. How I live my life, and what I do in my life doesn't affect my eternity. It's what I do with what Jesus did. If I accept His gift of salvation, then yes, I can go to hell. I can still fall away. And I can backslide. I can get away from the Lord. Look at the nation of Israel. It says, actually, there's a verse in the Old Testament that says that the nations around the nation of Israel blushed by what they did. Were they still God's chosen people? Yep. But they were living in a way that was so bad that the rest of the world looked at them and said, ain't no way I'd do that. I mean, the church in Corinth, messed up church, guy sleeping with his mother-in-law. I mean, they were messed up. But... They were still practicing the gifts. They were still believers. We can get away from the Lord. And it's, and it's easy for us. To, if we're not in the playbook, it's easy for us to start heading in the wrong direction. And I can get away from the Lord. That's why it's so important for me to be in the playbook every single day. Because if I'm not, I'm going to get away. And I, I believe the Lord will give us opportunities and do things to draw us back to him. And there's eventually a point where, like Paul says, that he turned them over. I believe that God eventually will say, you know what? You're one of my kids and you're not listening to me. It's time for you just to come home. I can keep an eye on you better up here than I can down there. Uh, people say when they're saved, uh, uh, they never, uh, God will never take salvation away from you or something like that. And they just keep it going on and not come to church. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's what happens to them. Yeah, and, and somebody like that, I have to look at them and wonder, did you actually really get saved? I mean, if they, even if they work, work for the Lord like that, do, do things and the noise of everything, mm-hmm. well, uh, you know, he says, your works don't save you. That's absolutely right. I have an uncle who's a preacher. He's a pastor. He was an assistant pa- He grew up a preacher's kid. He was an assistant pastor 
and then became a pastor. And it wasn't until about 10 years into his pastoring when he actually got saved. Can you imagine your preacher getting saved? Now shut up, because some of you are saying, he, well, I know what's wrong with Andy now. He needs to get saved. But, <laughs> but yeah, he was a pastor. And he said the reason he didn't, he knew he wasn't saved. He said the reason he didn't is because he was afraid what people would think. Uh, I was a verse. He says, I came into the world not to, not to condemn the world, but drew the world to me might be saved. That's right. So, Amen. Amen. Well, what did you talk about this morning? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I'm with you. Yes, sir. Very good. Anybody else? That might be. Uh huh. Absolutely. They can have him or they can reject him. Mm hmm. Yeah, I wonder, like I said, I wonder a lot of people who get away from the Lord. If they say, well, I'm a Christian, I can live however I want, that makes me wonder. And it doesn't make me wonder. It makes me think, you probably aren't really one of God's. You're going to be one of those, Lord, Lord, who are you? I don't know you. You ain't one of my kids. Because when we do come to him, old things are passed away. All things become new. Everything, my desires, everything changes. So if my desires don't change, something's missing. God's not a liar. So if all things didn't become new, Maybe I need to look back and say, did I really accept Christ as my Savior? Am I really one of God's kids? Yes, sir. Very good. Tony, did you got something? Yeah, you know, God is our, our coach, okay? But there's so many different plans of a game. Mm -hmm. If you want to look at it, the Bible. you got your personal walk. There's a coach there that's telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. Then you got a family. There's another uh, plan for the coach to give you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people just don't, even in the family, they haven't looked into the book, How to Run Your Family. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I had to learn that when I got saved. You know, I, a lot of things in my life I had to get away with. Mm -hmm. It's then, not easy. Yeah, then you got another plan, people where you work, you got company. Mm -hmm. There's so many things in our lives. We don't just got the one flip over. We got flips and flips and flips and flips and flips. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why it's important to listen. That's why we got that, that microphone or that speaker in our head and our, our helmet, the Holy Spirit, who's talking to us and telling us which play. <laughs> That's good. That was good. I don't have to write that down later. <laughs> The Holy Spirit is telling us, that, yeah, he's the speaker in the helmet. <laughs> Told you there's a lot of parallels between Christian life and football. Anybody else before we finish up? You know, I forgot to ask somebody to finish, to close us out. Tim's not here. Marcus, you want to close us out and pray? Nothing like putting you right on the spot right there. Tim's not here, so I'm forgetting stuff. <laughs> well, praise God. Uh, let's let's pray. That was that was so good, and um, I think it gives us a, a lot, just a lot to think about and a lot to consider. Uh, I love that last point, Andy. The Holy Spirit in your in your helmet. Um, guiding us into the truth. So let's pray. Jesus, we are um, we belong to you, God. We confess that without you, we have nothing. Jesus, you said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we agree with that, God. We say amen to that. Apart from you, we can do nothing. We don't have hope in ourselves. We don't have confidence in ourselves. God, we put our confidence and our trust, our faith, our belief in you. You are the cornerstone. You are the only one worthy that paid the price of sin. You raised from the dead, God, and so we have hope inside of us that the same spirit that raised you from the dead lives inside of us, and we will be with you one day. Jesus, we will be with you one day and see you in all of your splendor, all of your glory, all of your majesty, and every knee, every single knee will bow. 
Every tongue will confess that you are Lord of all. Jesus, we do it now. We're not going to wait until under compulsion that we have no choice but to confess. But God, today, this day, we choose you. This day we say, Jesus, you are Lord. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Where else can we go? It's only you that have the words of eternal life. God, we are so grateful to you, Jesus. We are so grateful for what you have done. I pray that you bless your children, bless your people, and help us to consider. The Bible says to consider whether you are in the faith. Help us, God, to consider it. Maybe there's, maybe there's part of our lives that we haven't given to you yet, Jesus. Maybe we've given 90% and said, you know what, God, you can have most of me, but not all of me. But Jesus, you don't ask for most of us. You don't ask for part of us. You say, give me all of you. All of you. And that's what surrender is. So help us, God, to surrender all. We don't want to say, after years and years and years of our life where we've been coming to church and we've heard the word of God and we've read the scriptures, we don't want to want to hear from you, I never knew you. How tragic, how sad. We want to know you now, God. Lord, I pray that you bless your people, bless your children. Help us to know you. Help us to, to hear your voice. Help us, God, to follow the playbook. We love you, coach. And if you agree with that, let's hear you say amen. 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 God bless.